Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good evening. It's good to see a lot of people uh, coming in from uh, from Europe and of course uh, North America. So the title of today's webinar is how sophisticated data solutions are transforming the O&M landscape. And this is the second webinar of our Webinar Tuesday series. So feel free to sign up through our website for the upcoming uh, webinar number three. My name is Kostis Tsanakaikis and I'm a project manager at Solar Plaza and I will be moderating uh, today's webinar. So what's the agenda of today? First, we will start with a short introduction to uh, the webinar and the panelists. And then we will uh, start by having uh, presentations um, on the topic uh, of uh, effective data gathering, organization presentations, and how this enables a more efficient O&M strategy. Understanding portfolio and plant data is critical in creating an effective O&M strategy. And it isn't enough to simply monitor a plant's uptime and address uh, the issues that arise. O&M and solution uh, providers must employ both real-time and predictive data analytics to minimize operating expenses uh, wherever possible. And today, Ben Hansen uh, of SMA and Peter Kobliska of uh, Green Power Monitor will discuss uh, how to, to manage data and uh, to have efficient O&M uh, strategy. In the end, there will be time for Q&A, and in general, the webinar will last for one hour. Once again, my name is Kostis. I'm a project manager at uh, Solar Plaza. I work on the Solar Asset Management Conferences in uh, Europe and USA. And this is our, these are my contact details, so feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions regarding Solar Asset Management or our conferences. For those of you that don't know Solar Plaza that well, we are a global information platform for solar PV, and our main business is organizing high-level B2B conferences and trade missions around the world. We have over 90, uh, over 100 uh, events in the last 13 years in more than 30 countries. And also we have a network of 60,000 solar professionals, and of course this is growing every day. This webinar is a pre-call to our yearly conference, Solar Asset Management North America. <clears throat> this year, this uh, is the fifth edition of the conference, and it is held in San Francisco on March 13 and 14. This is North America's leading conference dedicated to the optimization of the operational phase of PV plants and portfolios. There are a lot of topics that we'll be, we will be covering this year in the conference. O&M, uh, financial and technical asset management, advanced data analytics, market trends, innovative technologies, PPA, storage, and many more. And these are some of the companies involved so far. So don't miss a chance to meet a professional of all these organizations at the conference. Special thanks to our sponsors, including SMA and Green Power Monitor for making our conference and content possible. If you haven't registered yet, I would like to do so. We are providing today discounts for uh, this webinar. So you can use the code webinar20 on our website and the first uh, 10 registrations will get a 10% discount on the conference ticket. Some practical notes for the next uh, hour. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat box, should be on the right of uh, your screen. For Q&A, please also make use of the chat box. I would highly suggest you to uh, send us your questions during uh, the presentations, and we will address as many as possible afterwards. And the presentation slides and video recordings will be available afterwards at our website, www.solarestmanagement.us. So our first speaker for the day is uh, Ben Hansen, uh, Senior Manager for Global O&M Service Solutions at SMA America. In this role, Ben leads project management efforts to uh, design the O&M solutions that SMA offers around the globe. And prior to joining SMA, uh, Ben worked extensively in the construction and technology industries with companies such as AT&T and uh, Cisco Systems. Our next presenter is Peter Kobliska, Director of Business Development at Green Power Monitor. 
before his uh, assigning before yeah his current role, Peter worked as the original sales manager for Draker and expanded their portfolio about two times along the Western US. Peter brings technical expertise in SCADA, hardware, software, operation, and commissioning, and he leverages this knowledge to help his customer maximize uh, sites' performance and optimize the operation of their portfolios. So it's time to start. Uh, ben, I will be um, giving you control of the uh, of my mouse and keyboard in a few seconds. Okay, okay Ben, you right. have the floor. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction, Costas, and for uh, Solar Plaza for putting this webinar on. Um, again, my name is Ben Hansen, and uh, I'm representing the O&M Solutions team uh, for SMA. We are a global team working on our solutions uh, for O&M worldwide. Uh, today, what I'll be doing, though, is giving a, a, a brief overview, high level, not very technical. Um, that's not my approach at this point in time, but uh, just really to talk about how important it is to have a good strategy for effective data gathering and how to visualize that data. Go ahead, next slide. There we go. Um, briefly, uh, the main topics I'll cover are number one, using analytics to detect unknown issues. And then what we'll do is we'll transition to using predictive analytics to minimize operational expenses. And thirdly, optimizing maintenance schedules to impact profitability. So I have a, a brief scenario for you. And while I'm outlining this, just think to yourself how familiar this might seem to you. The preventative maintenance on your plant has just been completed on schedule. And from the inspections, everything seems to be working well. No alarms are going off on the SCADA. Nothing picked up in the IV curve trace that was just completed for 25% of the plant. However, the plant is putting out less power than it should. What is going on? So I, I would suspect that many of you on this call have experienced something similar to this in, the, in your experience in providing operations issues and maintenance services. So that leads us to our first poll question. What Coming percentage up. of your oh perfect. What percentage of your plants have some unknown issue that did not show up in SCADA or initial inspection? Is it less than 10%, 25%, 50%, or 75% or greater? Ben I will close uh, the poll in two seconds. Uh, let's see the results. Wow, that's an interesting spread. It, it's interesting. Um, and part of the, the question that we're going to answer here with this is it, we're looking for stuff that we may not know about. So there might be issues out there that are una that you're unaware of that you need that you could find through your effective data analytics. So we'll definitely dive into that. So how do we use analytics to detect unknown issues? Uh, back in 2013, the New York Times published uh, an article, and in, in, in it, it was quoted from Media Contro Medio Control, a review of over 30,000 installations in Europe found that. 80% were underperforming. So when you think back to your, your poll response, just note that in a, a, you know, a scientific survey, 80% of plants were underperforming, and that's out of 30,000 surveys. So chances are, if you didn't answer higher on the, uh, on the survey, it, there's a greater likelihood that there's something happening that you're unaware of. So my point is, is that all plants have some hidden issues. At SMA, you know, we're primarily an inverter company first, and we see a lot of those issues coming through the inverters via alarms or errors in the inverter, no matter where they're happening on the plant. But not everything shows up there either. Um, a recent survey actually indicated that 
up to 60% of the issues with plants have to do with modules and cabling. And those could be things like glass breakage, potential induced degradation. You might see bypass diode failures or module disconnects, short circuits, or even cell cracks. So a lot of those issues are happening out in the DC field. Inverters have far fewer issues, but when they do, they could have a greater impact. However, inverters tend to be good connection points for the data on plants. And often these are the lowest level of data that's available. Frequently what we're seeing is there are little to no sensors out in the DC field. And something that we've seen in our, in our O&M plants globally is uh, Europe and South America tend to have a lot more string level monitoring. Whereas in North America, it's, it's much less common to have that. So we've got a real difference in, in the granularity and where we can look at the plant to find things that are going on. So even if there are sensors out in the DC field, sometimes it's too much data coming in or you're getting too many alarms to spot real problems that are happening. Or the other problem might be happening too, no alarms are set up at all, so you don't have any idea what's going on out there. Even IV curve tracing can only show the percentage of the plant that was inspected. And sometimes it's just too expensive to do IV curve tracing to get a significant view of what's going on in your plant. Visual inspections, aerial thermography, they can give you a really good view of the entire plant. But again, often they're only done annually at best. And that's really only the, the snapshot annually that you're getting about what's going on on the plant. We all know that our customers and the owners they want accurate analytics, and they want those so they can understand and address the issues that are going on in the plant. Utility plants, especially portfolios, represent, or they can present too much data to see smaller patterns that are going on. We know that investors, they're very interested in getting good data, and they're really far more interested in good calculations. They wanna see the algorithms that you're using and the methodology. Sometimes they're much more interested in that than what software you're using, unless it's a top tier provider like GPM. Smart owners and operators, they know that proper use of big data improves the plant and portfolio performance and improves the reliability with less downtime and more energy output. All right, so how do we use analytics to continue to detect unknown issues? I'll say this. Getting good data is the key. There's a term out there called data janitoring, or sometimes people call it data wrangling. And really that's the first big hurdle to getting good understanding of plant performance. One of the issues that we run into though, is unfortunately even the best data scientists have to spend a lot of time first scrubbing and cleaning data to make sure it's useful before they can do any analysis on it. Some of the best practices to get good data Number one, make it all digital or make it reportable in an online format wherever possible. Secondly, use common nomenclature and common tags. We should use common terms for data points across all of our plants throughout a portfolio and hopefully throughout the industry. And third, we need to automate filters and scrubbing where possible. And this often includes uh, filtering alarms to remove the noise. We've probably got the majority of the alarms that will go off in a monitoring platform, really inconsequential. They're just things that you have to look at and turn off and address. Let's see if we can filter those out to remove the noise. And sometimes you'll run into problems where uh, you might re lose data in the process of, of bringing that into your uh, monitoring center. So we want to ensure that we have automated data recovery. And the purpose of that is to collect the data that may have been lost or not transferred due to data problems. You gotta plan for, for things like that so you can overcome it and actually see what's really going on in your plant. And once you have good data, the next thing is we need to employ solid statistical techniques. It's really helpful to have access to data specialists, especially people with a background in getting useful information from data. At SMA, we employ several data scientists and they love working on this stuff. It's, it's kind of funny to, to watch them talk about it. But the key areas to focus on are, number one, we gotta look at data mining. We've gotta do things like comparative analysis and predictive modeling. And I just wanna give you a word on benchmarking. 
um, data truly is only helpful in comparison to something similar. At a minimum, there should be a benchmarking or comparisons done at the plant level. For instance, benchmarking an individual's inverter's performance against nearby inverters would be a good thing to do. That way you can see that inverter in a similar environment and how it's operating compared to others. Another good comparison would be to do this plant-wide. How are these inverters operating compared to the whole plant? And that's really the beginning of our comparative analysis. And another way to benchmark is we could do this at the portfolio level. Chances are this isn't your only uh, plant that you're managing the O&M on. Take a look at the entire portfolio. What's similar between those, uh, uh, those different plants? You can adjust for geographical and weather differences and see what's going on with similar assets. What are the differences? And one of the things that we're also seeing right now is there's a very strong trend towards benchmarking against industry results, including our competitors. Now, if you can get this data, it's more than likely gonna be accessed in a, kind of an anonymous or an aggregate fashion, but this could be very useful information about your plant's performance. How are you really stacked against other plants in the region that, uh, that you're not managing? So in this data analytics, what are we looking for? We're looking for anomalies. We're looking for measurements that might be sitting just outside of the trends. And I think uh, Peter's gonna touch on this in, in a little bit more detail in his presentation. So even using just inverter data, you might be able to find small deviations that could lead to further indications of problems down at the string and eventually even at the module level if you keep, keep hunting and, and following that path. It's very helpful to benchmark assets against themselves over time. So when you do a, an initial comparative analysis, save that information. When you do it again, come back and look at how things are changing over time. It's more than just detecting new malfunctions or comparative analysis can actually indicate degradation. Uh, um, this is gonna be very helpful if you need to act in time to make claims on an asset while it's still under warranty. You wanna track what's going on there because it'll lead to some very useful information to make sure that you keep your plant healthy. Why did it change? There we go. All right, and let's let the machines do the heavy lifting. So you know, we all know it's very difficult for a performance engineer to get a download of data and to start looking for patterns. Very often, issues are buried deep in the data, and it's only slight variations that, that are almost near impossible for a human to detect. So machine learning really is the key for us. If we have clean data, we can let the machines review the data objectively. They're, they don't have any biases. They're just looking at, for patterns that they see. Computers can comb through the data, and they can go over it over and over without getting tired, and they can find new data relationships and tease out the patterns laying underneath. Fortunately, um, SMA, we've got access to 17 gigawatts of data to analyze, PV data. Um, it's one of the largest PV data sets in the world. And having a large data set is really beneficial for machine learning. We've been working on R&D projects to improve data intelligence at our ONM managed PV plants. And using comparative analysis and predictive modeling, we've been able to create algorithms that look for anomalies and patterns and even a very limited data set. So one of the outputs that we've recently been able to do, using sensor data and meter data, we're able to apply machine learning. And from those findings, what we have now, we're able to create uh, smart filters for sensor data. So what we're able to do is eliminate alarm noise and focus on the key alarms that actually mean something. We're able to create algorithms for meter data to keep finding the trends. And these filters and algorithms that we're able to create, they now allow us to create tickets more intelligently, and then take smart action at our plants to get things corrected. And one last uh, um, item on this is system integrations. Now that we've got all this good data coming in via our SCADA and monitoring, um, it's actionable data. It would be even more optimal if we could combine that with other key systems. These could be things like our asset management software, our ticketing systems, et cetera. 
So a good in, in, integration of these systems would allow us to find fixes based on experience. You know, we could look back in the past and see what alarms caused what fixes to take place and generally what was the, uh, the spare part that was used in that fix. The system then can then learn to associate common solutions and required spare parts with certain alarms and data. And that's gonna help us with forecasting and being much more efficient in our deployment of, of technicians. Secondly, with that systems integrations, we should be able to get to a point where tickets can be automated based on what is critical to address. The, uh, the system can do a lot of the thinking for us and determine where and when we need to dispatch. Okay, we're ready for our second and third poll question. So this question number two, what kind of impact will predictive analytics have on plant performance? Do you think it's minimal, moderate, or will it be huge? Let's see the results. Okay, so 43% say it's gonna be a huge impact. And I think we've got a lot of uh, realists out there saying it'll be a moderate impact probably initially, right? And, that, and that'll all depend on how well it's deployed. How well have you, do you understand your predictive analytics and what are you able to do with it? So interesting results there. Let's, let's go on to our, set, our third poll question. What level of predictive analytics does your O&M program use now? Is it some manual review periodically? Are you just starting an analytics program? Are you already good, using good predictive analytics for some time or are you not sure? What level of predictive analytics does your O&M program use now? Okay, yeah. It, this is, this is really reflective of probably where the industry's at right now. We, we know we need to do it and we've got some people that can do some things. So a manual review periodically is definitely where a lot of people are sitting right now. And, but we know we need to head into a more automated program, right? Um, some of the market leaders are, are really good at using this already and have been employing it, but a lot of the industry just is, is creeping into this area right now and needs needs to head there more aggressively. So thank you for your answers on those poll questions. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about, um, oh, I jumped ahead one, I think, there we go. How do we use predictive analytics to minimize operational expenses? Um, so now we're moving from finding existing issues to predicting future ones. Uh, fortunately, the techniques that we've already employed, they can be used to help us mitigate larger issues in the future. So what we're seeing, and, and this is a buzzword now, predictive maintenance is a really popular term in, in PV O&M. I think we all intuitively see the value in taking care of something before it becomes expensive. However, we don't always want to invest now to get to where we want to be. And I think our last poll question really indicated that. Um, we're kind of tentatively entering into a field that maybe we don't understand fully yet. So we, you know, we put people resources on that. Um, the immediate solution for us then, as we're entering into a predictive analytics uh, solution, is let's put a performance engineer in place. And let's have that person analyze the plant performance at regular intervals. And that could be as frequently as weekly or possibly even monthly. That person will make recommendations to improve plant performance, but he also might be ill-equipped to spot the trends and anomalies that could have a major impact if not addressed now. It's one of the things we talked about earlier is that um, sometimes there's so much data out there that it's difficult for human eyes and, and thought process to spot smaller anomalies that are going on. So, you know, it, a performance engineer can certainly get things going in the right direction, but it's probably not enough with all the copious amounts of data that are coming in. So predictive maintenance uh, should employ an appropriate use of machine learning and automation. Um, the advantage of this is the software can run analysis continually 
throughout a, a period of time. With automation, we can know today what an engineer might not spot for a week, a month, or more in the future. So machine learning can really recommend a course of action to preempt a larger repair issue. And this could be things like, for instance, uh, inverter filters and fans could be addressed with at preliminary signs of stress. And this would prevent a breakdown and more expensive repair later. Also using this data, how do we optimize maintenance schedules to impact profitability? We all know that any downtime on a plant has to be managed, and we have to manage that to minimize the revenue impact. Predictive analytics can also help us to optimize maintenance scheduling, and that will help us to have the greatest impact on increasing revenue. And so what we can do with that, we can use history as a guide, and we can employ forecasts and predictions to help us with this. Uh, preventative maintenance schedules are typically conducted on a calendar schedule, and that's usually per in, uh, manufacturer's requirements. And we do that so we can at least maintain warranty coverage. So if we know that, for instance, that the summer months are coming and stresses are going to increase on inverters, that could drive us to conduct a minor PM so that we're going out and addressing the fans and the filters just prior to a, you know, a really heavy workload. Uh, major maintenance could also be delayed to time when production will be least impacted. For instance, you might learn from the past that uh, certain periods of time in the future, you're going to experience curtailment on your plant. That might be an optimal time to go out and perform maintenance on certain sections of the plant. Um, we all know that module cleaning can have a huge impact on production, but it can also be very expensive to do it especially if it's overdone or if it's performed at the wrong times of the year. So we wanna employ forecasting and advanced cleaning algorithms to help us place panel washing at the correct frequency and at the optimal time of year for the greatest impact on production. That's such a key there. So those are preventative maintenance things. What about scheduling and repairs? So we can also schedule repairs when the greatest positive impact is maximized. And uh, you know we, we see in the residential market, for instance, they're very good at maximizing the value of a truck roll. And the way they do that is they wait on repairs until enough can be completed concurrently. And then they'll send someone out and take care of a bunch of things at once. Um, that strategy may not, not work the same in utility scale application, but the similar principles can be followed. When, when will I maximize the value of this repair? And I really believe that good data analytics they're going to reveal true areas on the plant that need attention to us. And I believe that we can also develop algorithms that'll help us determine when the cost of a repair will yield a positive return on our investment. There we go. So in, in closing, I think we all know it's a foregone conclusion that improving plant yield and driving down costs in PV is going to require a substantial focus on data management in our O&M programs. Manual review of data is really going to be insufficient for dealing with the large volumes of information that must be addressed to be successful. That's why at SMA, we're making a substantial investment in research and resources to greatly improve plant analytics. It, it's an absolute must. It's also why we're partnering with companies like GPM to provide the next generation solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ben. Lots of uh, information, high level, as you as you mentioned, but uh, indeed very interesting. We have already a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions, but we will have to to wait. Uh, Peter, I I will give you now control, and also uh, you will have the floor in a couple of seconds. All right, Peter, you are good to go. Peter, can you hear us? You're good to go, Peter.
There, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Sorry, I was uh, muted there for a minute by uh, by organizer. My apologies. So I'm Peter Kobliska. I'm the director of business development for Green Power Monitor. I typically help out de defining and, and designing technical solutions on a post sales or uh, pre sales basis, looking at the the best fit solution to to maximize either kind of the performance and the customer needs of a project, plant, or portfolio, and that can uh, kind of spawn into a variety of different things, depending on the needs of each customer and each project. On a post-sale side, I help uh, a lot with defining goals for the customer and making sure that the tool is customized, the GPM tool is customized to, to get what they need to out of it, either at an operational standpoint, a financial standpoint, or just a, a, a basic understanding of how their portfolio is performing. So coming into using data systems for, for operational maintenance and predictive modeling, there's a huge driver, in my opinion, for, there we go, for defining success. A lot of customers uh, that we work with and clients we work with are, are quick to pull the trigger to fix the, the next big problem because maybe a customer is calling who's very mad or angry, or maybe there's a catastrophic event and people want to go out there and fix it and bring the plant back to the way it was prior. But the having very well defined goals for success and being able to measure those goals with data is is critical to operational success and this success can mean a few different things depending on on which side of the project you're on you can be looking to to maximize performance of certain devices in the field or uh, maximize the performance of your plants in general or your portfolio as a whole you can be looking for operational efficiencies, similar to what Ben mentioned um, for on the residential market, how they're uh, very well optimized, making sure that one truck roll is touching a, a multitude of projects. So you can extrapolate that onto a commercial site with the proper amount of data, and if they're in a, a well-suited region as well, of course, geographically. But you should be looking to to maximize your truck rolls and and just your operational choices in general. Whether that means you're closing out two tickets, two work orders, visiting and, and either fixing something as well as checking something each time you have a technician visit a site is pretty critical from an operational standpoint. Kind of tied along with that is a cost benefit analysis. Um, so often I, I see um, a lot of operators are fast to fix things because they that's what they're paid to do. They want to fix things. But are they looking at the financials of it and, and making decisions based on where am I going to get the most bang for my buck? Kind of along with that ties to customer satisfaction. And, and this can mean a multitude of things, of course, and is probably one of the hardest to measure. But as an O&M provider, um, you definitely want to be giving your clients, customers, and the site owner a sense of, of calmness and security that you are looking after their plant and making sure that it is operating to the best and maximum ability that it should be. Ben brought up a great point of baselining. This is a perfect way to uh, to show your customers that you are meeting expectations for what that plant is able to produce because of course that changes over time. And, and lastly, uh, an easy measure for success is your contractual obligations. Are, are you are you meeting your financial obligations, your contractual obligations? Are you doing your site visits at um, you know premeditated intervals? And and that can mean a multitude of things, which is fairly easy to measure. And I think most of us are doing in the industry today. So this brings me to question number one. Cost system, you mind pulling that up? And how often are your field techs inputting data back into their SCADA system? Very often, semi-often, rarely, or not aware of this possibility currently. give a few more seconds here to respond and kind of evenly spread between rarely and, and not aware of this possibility seems like the majority um, nobody said that we're doing this very often which is is not surprising to me coming from a, a data company um, we stress on having the most amount of data possible for our systems of course that's what we want that's what makes our tool stronger that's what makes your portfolio better and your ability to make decisions better. So we want as much data as possible. Now, most people think data only comes from the field. And this is kind of a, a typical asset data life cycle. So starting at the top here, we typically receive data from the devices in the field. We're measuring and monitoring performance uh, or just raw data that's coming into to our tool and our interface. Any data acquisition system should be able to turn that into information. And that can be in the form of graphs, charts, dashboards, Every, every, any data solution you choose will be able to do that. 
But now we want to advance that a little bit and turn that into Intel. And intelligence could take the form of smart alerts or advanced reporting, um, ticketing services or work orders, um, some asset management uh, abilities built into your data and your, and your, sorry, your DAS and your SCADA applications. And ultimately that lends itself to making correct operational decisions that again, will be maximizing your, your goals of success, whatever they may be. And that's typically where the data life cycle ends. You know, we, we get information out of the tool, we go and we act on it, and then that's it. What I'm asking for is that you guys start looking at, you know, especially when we talk about preventative maintenance, taking that operational decision, whatever that was, be it a truck roll, or maybe, you know, after watching performance on a certain plant, you decide to use a different manufacturer's equipment. Maybe you, you choose a different model of inverter because you want to go from central to string. Maybe you choose a, a different tracker motor, or you decide to go to a, a fixed tilt. Um, after you see all the operational costs associated, you know, on a certain plant that you may have. Those are all operational decisions. It doesn't always correlate with a truck roll directly. And that information should be fed back into your data system somehow. Um, through a work order, through a ticket, through kind of um, uh, an open forum that's potential. Because that information then can start helping kind of an assisted learning within your data acquisition platform so that you start recognizing patterns and you start making predictive modeling based on actions you've taken in the past to see what the benefit is. So often we talk about preventative maintenance and, and Ben did a great job talking about that and also asking a, the polling question, which I, I love the responses for. There's a lot of um, desire for it and people see a lot of value in it, but it's hard to calculate what you're getting for the amount of effort you put in. Because if you prevent the problem, you can't prove to your customer how much money you save them. All you can prove is how much it costs to go fix something that wasn't broken yet. And that's a hard proposition. So typically what we do in the industry is we, we do a, a risk abatement um, kind of proposition where we say, oh, you know, talking to our owner or the client, telling them, hey, we fixed something that could have happened and here's what, you know, what we saved by it not happening. Here's what, what the, you know, we, we paint a bad picture and say we avoided this. That can be somewhat powerful for some customers, but what I'd like to transition to would be a, a benefit and value analysis, saying, hey, because I went out there and fixed this ahead of time, I can prove that now my inverters, all my inverters are, are performing within 5% of my previously my best performing inverter. So I've increased production by 7% with my last visit. I think that's a stronger thing to prove, and you can prove that with the data, saying because of my site visit, I'm, we're now generating X amount of power, or we have this much more uptime or availability increase by X percentage. And, and that equates very quickly to measurable dollars and cents and is a good value proposition to start bringing to your, to your owners and clients when you start talking about um, budgeting for, for O&M, for future O&M. And that's something that's provable by your data source today. And it's critical that you have your operational decisions feed data back into your system for that purpose. So now we talk about a little bit about a data solution in general, and what should it bring to the table so that you can do this? These are four main buckets I'm talking about today, but of course there's way more that goes into a, a data solution that needs to fit your applications and, and your needs. So starting on the top, we should uh, look at a comprehensive data solution. And this can mean a variety of things, but ultimately um, a comprehensive data solution should mean a few things. You should be able to select a provider that can talk to any type of device or any type of technology, somebody who has some breadth and depth in the, of experience in the industry to talk to your inverters, your transformers, your substation equipment, security systems, forecasting, um, forecasting services, of course your inverters, meters, weather stations, et cetera. All that information should be able to be captured by your data system. And you should be able to view that data from any mobile platform, be it your phone, a tablet, a laptop, in your NOC or ROC center back at your main headquarters. And ultimately, Ben brought up a great point, no monitoring solution um, or SCADA application that I've ever seen in the industry is a one size fits all. And no matter how companies want to position this, your organization or your client's organization is going to be using multiple different software platforms, um, especially when it comes to their accounting or maybe their, their HR or your inventory management or your operational workflow. Those are all gonna be different systems. And rather than trying to find one solution that can meet all of those needs, whether that can happen or not, you definitely wanna pick a data solution today that can at least share information back and forth between your internal platforms. And, and that's critical to success, is being able to feed your, your operational information or your financial information 
into your SCADA tool and vice versa from your SCADA tool into those other um, internal databases and, and services you're currently using today. You want your data acquisition system to be uh, success driven. So again, looking at that feedback loop, making sure you're being, being able to pour information back into your tool from your operator site visits or from analysis analyses from your um, performance engineers, that should all be tracked and rated in back into your system so that a, a proper decision made by one performance engineer should be replicated across your portfolio. So it shouldn't come down to that, that one or two people with that skill level. They should make that their decisions known across the board uh, through a feedback loop. And that kind of goes to help with the assisted learning. GPM is currently looking into um, uh, very seriously developing machine learning capabilities where we do, you know, kind of pattern recognition to look for faults before they happen, saying when these conditions were present, we noticed that, you know, there was a series of alarms arisen and try to avoid that or notify our operators to, uh, to go out there and preventively fix something prior to it happening. That assisted learning is definitely available today through operator feedback coming back into the tool. And again, I would be looking for platforms that are, are exploring machine learning opportunities or, or AI um, abilities in the near future. And of course, every single platform today, um, I'm, I'm happy to say this has been increasing in their operating dashboards um, with the either visibility into your plant performance and analytics to, um, I mean, just across the board of through alerts, Every platform is is getting better and people are putting a lot of time and energy into making uh, information at your fingertips valuable and, and not just there and, and um, something to look at, but something you can pull out of the tool and start playing with and uh, and really get make a good basic decision from. And this leads us to our next two questions back to back here. And we'll start with question two. How often do you perform a post site visit analysis? Almost always, most of the time, some techs are better at it than others, almost never. Wow, that's a, a much more even spread than I anticipated, um, which I'm, I'm good, but also somewhat surprised to see. And I guess my, my next question will be, uh, pertinent now. Let's go ahead and pop that third question up here. In a post-site visit, do you review your cost benefits? Yes, no, not sure. That's more along the lines of what I expected. So we're doing a post-site analysis, but what are we doing exactly with it? And what's the deliverable? So that's, that's a great question. So we do some sort of post-site analysis and that might not have a, a common place or a, you know, a direct output, but what we need to start doing is showing your clients and the site owners that our predictive or our, our site visits that we are performing are of value. And it should be more than just a, a basic work order or site visit kind of completion template or whatever kind of commissioning document you might have from each site visit. But it should really go into a financial map model saying, because we went out on site, we increased performance or uptime or whatever your measurable success um, metric is. We increased it by X percentage and, and that which should equate to uh, dollars and cents over a period of time or immediately, that, that should reign true for your, your client and, and site owner so that they're seeing value from your site visit rather than just um, continuous costs of having to go out there and one more time to fix one more thing. Um, you know, we should, I'd like to see a, a transition again away from a, a risk abatement uh, value proposition to a benefit value proposition. So now we start looking at preventive maintenance and, and portfolio tracking from your performance modeling tools and your, your SCADA tools. What should you really be getting? And um, when we start talking about asset management, you want to be able to customize your tool um, based on either the business decisions you, you need to be making or again, your success drivers. So that could mean you know, a profit loss calculation. Um, you know, not only, again, are we looking at profit loss, but profit gained calculations. Hey, because I went out there to fix something, um, here's the, the increase in performance. And a, a perfect easy example to see this is the soiling um, and panel washing. To say, okay, we're, we're losing, you know, 14% performance. And the moment you wash panels, you can immediately see a benefit. 
and that benefit should be tracked and reported and, and given to uh, your, your site owners. And it, I think it's assumed that they know and see and understand the value, but I think the O&M companies need to be singing their own praises when they perform either simple routine functions like that or go out there for repair or preventative costs. You're looking at budget dashboards. These are making sure that your actual performance um, of the plant in your portfolio meet your expectations prior to construction. And again, this also stresses back into what Ben was talking about, about baselining. You should constantly be baselining performance, uh, not only for your customers' to, for your customers' expectations, but also, again, for your own success factors, saying, hey, the, a plant at, at year three will operate completely different than a plant at year one, than a plant at year 10. And you should be baselining that annually, um, if not more, to make sure that the expected performance for that site is, is reasonable and obtainable. And of course, looking at contractual exemptions. Uh, again, those are, are pretty black and white, especially if you are uh, pretty stringent about signing and writing good contracts. And here's another little quick picture of a different type of report or dashboard you can pull out. So what you want from any data provider would be able to see at a high level, are you meeting um, your, your needs and do you see any outliers in a lack of performance and with that ability to, to take information at a high level, you want to start drilling down into a smaller level. So here we can start seeing a, a scatter plot, which is a great way to look at um, a, a relation or correlation between uh, how a device is operating given certain other parameters. And this is taken from a real plant uh, earlier, earlier this week um, that we're monitoring. And you can see here a, a, a bundled of points um, from a particular plant. We have a distressed asset here. And now it's not exactly clear why directly from a SCADA plot, but it means abundantly clear that there is an asset that is not performing the way it should be, and especially not performing like the others. And it's a, a obvious case of an outlier when we look at a normal performance day, something like this. And so it, it's, it's very clear and obvious to pull something out like that. And that's the type of automated pattern recognition that, that we're building into the tool currently that you should hope to see in the future from your um, data providers. It would be a notification saying, hey, this unit on this distressed asset, it's still performing, it's still on, it's still working, it's still technically available. So you might not be getting any kind of registered alarm for it. But that looks, in terms of predictive maintenance, that if you fix that, you'll be performing much better uh, either very soon or you'll prevent a, a kind of a, a large catastrophic repair or failure in the future. Another example that I'm going to spend some time talking about is a, a type of heat map like like this. And on each of these rows on this report are different devices, and each column is a five minute time sample. And this is that kind of comparative normalized report that, that GPM provides, which is incredibly valuable for looking at different assets across your plants, be it any type of generation source at, at any level of the plant. So you could be looking at meters or inverters or combiner boxes or strings or at the modular level if you have that kind of data coming into your tool. You can do a comparative analysis to take a look and, and see how your plant's performing kind of top down. And so very quick, quickly, we can start to see a grouping of areas over time, typically as a weather-based um, weather issue. Um, but however, what we're looking for is a, a single device or a group of devices that are distressed over time. And this is definitely a performance issue. Here's another great example, and it's incredibly clear visually speaking to see that asset that's that's not working properly and again it's on it's communicating it's talking it's producing power it's producing energy but it's not the level of its peers and so it makes me start thinking okay it's maybe not an alarm yet but if i'm going to roll a truck out there i need to have you know my technician stop by inverter 14 because and run an ir scan maybe I have a few dead panels maybe there's soiling that's just particular to that one string or there's damage on a module Maybe there's excess heat coming from a combiner box from a loose connection. Um, maybe the fan's plugged on the inverter. Maybe the trackers are wrong, and I can start checking trackers. But the point is that this is abundantly clear that this needs a, a more detailed analysis based on simple pattern recognition that your tool should start alerting you for um, and that your operator should be notified. This is a great way to make a business decision before something fails. And um, that's just a, a, a proper way to do it, in my opinion, for when we're looking at pre predictive maintenance. This also, when I start talking about the benefit-driven value proposition, if you look at the underperforming inverter here, it's very quickly and easily identifiable visually speaking. But if we run some data here from one of the better performing peers on the exact same plant saying, 
we expect to have, let's say, 500 kilowatt hours per day per inverter on this site. That's a lot, I know, but, and with this distressed asset, we're currently producing, you know, 420 or, or 320. Well, if you can prove to your owner, hey, I can, by my site visit, I can produce, you know, 120 kilowatt hours more per day because of the, the preventive action that I took, that really equates to dollars and cents. And we should be spelling that out and connecting the dots for the, the site owners or the financiers to let them know that the O&M that we provide has a lot of value um, in, in a true sense. And it's not just a continuous operating cost, but it truly is a benefit driven function. And you know, to, to wrap this up, your information system is just that. Whatever data acquisition tool you use or SCADA tool you use, it's information, it's information, it's intelligence, it's data, whatever you wanna call it. At the end of the day, in my opinion, it's almost worthless without action. And that action comes from dedicated O&M providers or service providers like SMA or one of your choice that is is has attention to detail and is focused on creating successful solutions and remedies for items and issues in your portfolio and your projects. Thank you, everybody, for your time, and, and thank you, Solar Plaza and Costas, for, for putting this all together. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Also, you, Ben, earlier. You do have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, just as a, as a comment from me, it was, yeah, it's impressive to see the importance of, uh, of closing the loop and how many people are not taking this into account. It's a first rule in control theory, right? Um, let's start with uh, a first round of question uh, to you both. Uh, you both talked about uh, preventive maintenance. So if you recommend uh, preventive maintenance uh, today, what kind of, of, of hurdles uh, do you see for uh, broad adoption of this uh, technology? Maybe we can start with you, Peter. The biggest hurdle I see is customers wanting to see the value or benefit from preventive maintenance. And it is very difficult to say, hey, I'm gonna spend $5,000 and we're gonna get that value back. And it's hard to see when or why. So providing that when and why saying, if I take a site roll today or a site visit today and it's gonna cost $3,000 to run a technician out there for the next day or two, I, want to, I would like to see um, our O&M providers give a very strict kind of, here's our expectation of performance in increase, which ultimately is a, a dollars and cents increase um, based on my site visit. And I think that'll make owners and, and uh, financiers much more comfortable again with, with us going out to site before there's an issue, before there's a problem. Yeah, I think what Peter's saying is, is, is accurate. I think there's, there's two different concepts of preventive maintenance we're talking about. There are things that are kind of baked into your core uh, price that you're paying for your O&M contract, things that are scheduled that are gonna happen regardless, that must happen per that schedule to maintain a warranty. And there are things that will optimize the, the production on the plant. And again, the easiest example to look at is uh, soiling and how important it is um, to be able to quantify the, the benefit of doing that. Uh, you can do soiling or, or uh, panel washing all year long, you know, you could go out monthly and do it, but it'd be very expensive to do. And you certainly wouldn't yield a return unless it was a very, you know, heavily soiled area. That's why it's really important to develop an algorithm that starts to look into the future and figure out, okay, we know that this time of year, it gets particularly uh, dirty and it really impacts yield. It's optimal for us to get in here and clean at this time of year. It's, it's being able to make those comparisons and I'm, I'm really glad that Peter's really kind of hammering home on that is to, to show the positive impact of, of your maintenance, right? And some of these things that we, I think we really need to do that on are the things that aren't regularly scheduled that kind of happen uh, as needed. And it's, that's where we really got to look at our analytics to help us show when the best time to do those things are and what the yield is going to be. Thank you both uh, for your answers. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, things that you have not, uh, yeah, maintenance that you have not planned to do. So um, we talked today about um, uh, alarms. So um, yeah, regarding accuracy of, of data. So let's say that we have uh, 10, uh, 10 alerts uh, that need um, 
to be managed and you you roll the you roll the track based on these uh, alarm situations how many of those track rolls would you say that are a result of uh, of an actual uh, yeah damaged uh, a component or they're just a error a false alarm well, I'll, I'll go first prior to the truck roll because uh, I'll let Ben speak to more of the truck roll since he's on that side. But on, on the data side, you should definitely feel comfortable and secure that, that you've set up your data acquisition system to be telling you accurate information. And most uh, data acquisition systems in the market, they come with a, a default set of alerts or alarms or some, some kind of basic or rudimentary condition-based alerting. But in, it's largely up to the owners and operators to start to continue to adjust those alerts, to continue to refine them, and to define new alerts that actually mean something and that they know are not just noise, but um, you know action required uh, alerts that that have value in the field. So prior to rolling a truck for 10 alerts that you see, I would definitely validate to make sure you know with a performance engineer that that all 10 alerts are are truly um, active and, and coming as reliable information that, that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and I would say I don't really have any good operational percentages to give you, you know, what percentage of those alarms or alerts are, are really inconsequential. That, but that points back to the, the issue of being able to measure that. What's the impact of that alarm? Are these things that are, that are really power producing or not, or power impacting? And the ones that are, that's where we have to be good enough to say, okay, how much power is this is this losing? Do I can I wait on this to go out and fix it? You know, uh, Peter showed some great um, uh, pictures of uh, you know the heat map, for instance, is really good to show us. Okay, we have some impact here, but maybe that input impact is really not great enough to require us to go out and send someone out. I know it's going to cost me uh, several hundred dollars per day or whatnot to send a technician to fix something. Am I getting that kind of loss and how long can I go without fixing that? So that's where it really comes back into your operations center and your performance engineering to be able to make those determinations. Okay, now I have enough of these or the, the cost of not addressing this right now is gonna be greater than taking the action. Um, it does require a lot and I think there's a lot of analysis that can be done ahead of time without having to actually go and you know, look at something directly on a plant, just to actually put some good filters in place, good data management that I think can turn a lot of those things off. Uh, some of those things are learnings from past plants or past experience that, hey, we let's change our settings a little bit here and see if we can dial into the things that really matter. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, remember who uh, of you two showed the, the poll? I think it was uh, it was you, Peter, about the impact of uh, predictive maintenance and uh, yeah, that you were asking to quantify it for the future. Uh, maybe you can give us uh, your point of view about this. So how do you think it's going to be the impact, let's say, in five years from today, provided that you have set it up uh, correctly? Five years is a fair amount of time, and with, with proper kind of that that feedback loop coming from your technicians, I, I think we should see a a trend in the market um, from owners and operate from owners actually or, or lenders saying um, not only do we want to have kind of routine based you know scheduled maintenance that, um, for for basic warranty upkeep as well as just you know best practice uh, in the industry. But also, like you said, to to really see, start seeing um, a trust of owners and a willingness to say, hey, this, this is worth the amount of money that I'm setting aside and, and budgeting for my own M uh, for future use. It's worth it because I now know and trust what my operators are doing and the decisions they're making based on the data they're getting from their tools. And the more we can flush that out of the um, one, what the true operating costs are of plants, and to the benefit of those operating costs, I think that'll um, make lenders uh, much more reasonable in, in setting aside own M budgets. But right now, it's we're all seeming to to either have a, a race to the bottom that's that's going to be unsuccessful for for a lot of people, um, or just unrealistic expectations that that will hurt the solar industry as a whole uh, um, in terms of the financial models we're putting together for the the life of these projects. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Ben, one other question for you. So coming from SMA uh, and inventor, inverter and vendor, uh, what can you tell us about failure mechanism of inverters? Uh, what kind of failures can be uh, predicted and are there some that uh, they cannot? That's a good question. I, I alluded to that earlier in the presentation. I think what you're able to start seeing is, is stress on an inverter and there's different alarms and, and things within the, the machine that start to indicate that you know you might have heating problems or you know anywhere that things that can melt fan or filtering. Um, you can see different uh, on and off cycles with switches and things within an inverter. Those are all things that can be compared and matched against other inverters in the field to see that in, an indication that something's not operating the same way that other things are. So, you know, a lot of that is addressed in your preventative maintenance cycle, but there are things that are starting to go wrong that you can learn over time. I know our, you know, our regional competency center, which is our kind of our level two um, field service engineers here in the, in the center, they're looking at those things all the time. Um, taking in the inverter data and analyzing to figure out what's what's going to happen based off of these, uh, these indicators that we're getting. So uh, there are any number of things we could look at, um, but usually there's gonna be some indication up front of stress. Um, something is happening out of the ordinary that you could look at that's gonna indicate, okay, that and that's part of this system and that's where we need to go and, and drive into the inverter and, and figure out what it is. All right, thank you. Let me ask one last uh, question, a bit more uh, more general. Uh, Peter, you talked about uh, benchmarking. Um, do you have any issues or challenges with regards to data pri privacy when it comes to to benchmarking? How do you manage this? With with data privacy? Yes. Um, I'm not really sure how that would affect benchmarking per se. Um, typically, if uh, if an owner has given access to their O&M company, you know the the O&M company has has rights or privileges to run a, a type of benchmark that they need to with whatever access that they've previously been given by their by the the site owner. Um, I, I haven't seen an issue where where data privacy has been an issue in terms of benchmarking or performance monitoring. Um, typically, we we I guess uh, regulate that from the you know early stages of a project, knowing who should have access and what access we should be given to certain users. So we monitor and maintain that from the owner's perspective um, to whatever specifications they define. Makes yeah, sense. I think there would be some uh, you know on on ownership uh, permission would certainly be required for this, but anything uh, where we're starting to aggregate that data in an industry type perspective or with a, a trade group that would certainly need to be, you know, specifics about a plant redacted. So that we're looking at it in the aggregate. Maybe we just know that it's a plant in this region uh, or whatnot. So if we, if we start to gather data like that from an industry wide perspective, yeah. Uh, with owner's permission, certain uh, privacy items redacted. So we, we can't pinpoint exactly what it is but we can start to look at generalities and I think that's going to be very helpful for us in the long term. Definitely. All right, uh, Ben and Peter, thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, your presentations and your answers to all the questions. It's now time to wrap up the, the webinar. Many thanks also to all our attendees uh, for uh, their inputs and of course their participation. I hope this webinar was of value to everybody. If you have any questions or remarks, please feel free to reach out to me at uh, costis at solarplaza.com. And of course, uh, we hope to meet you at our conference in, uh, in San Francisco or in any of our upcoming uh, conferences, for example, uh, the one in Japan or um, an upcoming one in Mexico in October. So I wish a great day to, to everybody and I'm looking forward to meeting you in uh, San Francisco. Thank you very much. Thank you.